Yeehaw! Welcome. Welcome to a fearless edition of Fearless with Jason Whitlock. Uh, a cowboy edition of Fearless with Jason Whitlock. See, I got my uh, Nashville appropriate shirt on. Yeehaw! I'm getting quite acclimated to things here in Nashville. I'm starting to dress like, you know, I got my cowboy boots on underneath this desk. Uh, and that's because we have a special edition of uh, Fearless today. Happy Friday to you and yours. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, Uncle Jimmy, doing much better. I think uh, he's gonna have a little, some staples removed, I think on Monday. I don't know if I'm giving out too, information, too much information, but our guy is on the road to recovery. Uh, he'll be back with the show uh, very soon, but the show must go on and we're carrying on without Uncle Jimmy. And we have a special edition of, of Fearless with Jason Whitlock today. We have one topic, one subject, and it's someone you're familiar with, uh, Shamika Michelle. Uh, for those of you uh, that weren't paying close attention all this week, uh, Shamika dropped a bomb on us uh, earlier this week. I believe it was on Monday or Tuesday at the latest, but uh, she dropped a bomb on us about uh, her past life. I was talking about, or we were talking about, uh, Larry Miller, the chairman of uh, the Jordan brand for Nike, and his cover story for Sports Illustrated, where he confessed to having murdered someone as a 16-year-old. He murdered an 18-year-old in 1965 in Philadelphia, and we were having a conversation about the way Sports Illustrated unpacked the story and how I didn't really buy how Sports Illustrated unpacked the story and th they hid some of the truth. And so Shamika, in being as transparent as, as she always is, and you gotta remember, she's written a book called uh, The Naked Truth or Naked Girls. Uh, and she, I think she's got a website or called Naked Girls. Uh, or keep it naked. Is that, am I right? Keep it naked. And <clears throat> it's a book about transparency and honesty and living uh, a very transparent and not being ashamed. And so I'm going to have to confess, I haven't read the book. I didn't want to buy the book. And I'm just, I'm just going to keep it real because she's naked on the cover of it. And I live such a paranoid life about getting me too uh, <laughs> that I didn't want to buy the book because I didn't want a book of Shamika naked in my home or in my possession. Uh, and so <clears throat> I haven't read the book. Uh, I have over these past couple months been getting to know Shamika, but I did not know that as an 18 year old college freshman, she was involved in a fight uh, with a girl and things escalated and Shamika shared a story that, look, well, I'm just gonna play a clip and here's what Shamika said on the show earlier this week. To me, he is using this to just sell a book. The fact that he claims that he has remorse for or that he's felt bad all this these years is a crock of crap. I tried to shoot somebody when I was in college. I shot at her the first time, I missed, then I held the gun to her head and pulled the trigger, but the gun jammed. I have not been uh, quiet about that. I've been open about it because I've used it to teach my children about making bad decisions and having a bad attitude, to teach other people about making sure that you know how to control your anger. They started calling me quick draw at, at school because they just knew, okay, this girl has a gun and she's not afraid to pull it out or, or fire it. Uh, so that confession from Shamika shook me up and I told, we unpacked it a bit on Monday, uh, probably we spent 10, 15 minutes on it, but I promised that, hey, look, later in the week, we're going to have to have a more, a longer discussion and more of an unpacking of the life and times of Shamika Michelle. 
uh, we can't do this when I'm, I'm surprised and just learning this. And because one, I really like what Shamika brings to the show. And I wanna make sure that we tell her story uh, in a way that makes sure that the audience is comfortable with Shamika Michelle and who she is today at age 46, as opposed to who she was at 18. And so I kept saying all, all week, we're gonna get to it, we're gonna get to it. And so here we are today on Friday, and, and we're gonna bring Shamika on to uh, get a little bit more into her background so that we all understand her story. And I think, obviously, I've talked to Shamika throughout the week off air, and I have a bit more of an understanding of her story. But uh, I think it's interesting, it's fascinating. You gotta remember, <clears throat> I hold very, you know, Christian values. And, and I have, and one of the first thoughts I, I, I thought about when Shamika told her story and what I thought about all this week is, if a guy friend had told me this story, what would my reaction be? And, and, and this is just me being completely transparent. I, I, I have some friends, and I, I'm thinking of, of one friend in particular who's uh, in jail right now. He hasn't been, I don't think, convicted yet, but uh, you know, was involved in a shooting and in the death of a person. And the guy was a friend of mine. And I'm gonna be honest, I still consider him a friend. Um, and it's not that I don't judge his sin because I do, but man, people live very complicated lives and are at different stages in their lives at different times. And, and, and um, I just know that if a guy told the story Shamika told, we would have a different reaction. We've listened to rappers, particularly male rappers, for decades brag about all the things they allegedly did and all the things they're allegedly involved in. And, and uh, w w what is uh, 50 Cent song, Many Men? Uh, <laughs> it's basically him telling a backstory about what he did, what happened to him and what he did to somebody and 50 Cent's a respected celebrity and uh, Snoop Dogg went on trial for murder, uh, put out a video, Murder Was the Case. It's a very satanic song. Snoop Dogg's one of the most beloved celebrities we have here in America. Jay-Z, all these guys. And so uh, let's make sure as we listen to Shamika tell her story, let's don't be hypocrites here. Uh, let's try to listen with an ear of understanding and let's be respectful of who she is today at 46 as opposed to who she was at 18. So uh, Shamika, welcome back uh, to the show. And, and I, I guess I wanna start here, if you could. Let's go beyond or back before you were an 18 year old freshman at North Carolina a and I believe. Uh, yes. Let's let's go back before that. How did you grow up? Where did you grow up? What what, what kind of childhood did you have? Well, I think I had a really good childhood considering I am a product of rape. My mother was raped at 14 going to cheer camp and I was born to her at 15. Initially, the thought was she was going to give me up for adoption, but then she changed her mind. However, she was still young and living with my grandmother. Uh, so that was a decision that she couldn't make on her own. Initially, my grandmother was not for her bringing me home, and I stayed with a family friend for about two months, and my grandmother would come and visit me, and eventually she decided that she wanted to bring me home. At the time, my mother was in an all-girls school in Stanton, Stanton, Virginia, because she had won a scholarship to go to an all-girls school. So for the first two years of my life, except for holidays or weekends when my my mother got to come home I was with my grandmother and my uncles you know they if my grandmother had to go to work my uncles took care of me one who was only 11 years older than me so they were really young and teenagers trying to help out with the newborn 
Let me, I got to ask a very personal question, so I apologize up front. Did your mom know the man who raped her or was it a complete stranger? A complete stranger. And was anyone ever convicted of that crime? Do you know who your father, did you ever meet or know who your father was? No, she actually didn't tell anyone. The, um, so she went on back to school. I think her, one of her friends may have known, but she was younger than her. And I think her sister knew who was just a little bit older than her, but she went on back to school. My grandmother did not know, nor my grandfather. He didn't live in the home. She went back to school and I think it was, um, after the the person in charge of the school, his wife noticed, someone in the cafeteria noticed that every time my mother would eat, she would go uh, leave the cafeteria and go and throw up. And so they finally, you know, brought my mom in, wanted to talk to her and was asking her if she was pregnant. She said no. They even had the test. She still kind of felt like, you know, even though she knew she was pregnant, it was not something that she really acknowledged at 14 years old. And so I think they put her on suicide watch after that and they just kind of watched her once they realized that she was pregnant. And right before I was born, I think a month before I was born, she was sent to a home for um, unwed mothers in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, Florence Cretanton, I believe is the name of the home that's all in my book. And she was sent there where she stayed until I was born. And so knowing that you were a product of rape, did that screw with you mentally cause any sadness or how did that, how does that or did that impact you mentally? I think initially it did. I can remember being in school and you would have to fill out those papers, you know, when you first started school and tell like who your mother is, who your father is. I remember having to fill that paper out and leaving my father blank. And I remember the teacher calling me back to the desk and saying, you didn't put anything for your father. And she asked me, out, though, though I was at her desk, she asked me out loud. And so I remember trying to whisper to her to say, I don't have a father. And she goes, what? What? And I'm like, I don't have a father. And she goes, everybody has a father. What do you mean? And I just remember crying, like being in tears because to me, I didn't have a father. Like there was nothing that I could tell her for that answer. And here it is. She's getting angry at me because I'm not giving her a name. And um, so I remember that when I was really, really young. And I remember my mom having to come and talk to the teacher and explain to her what was going on. But by the time I was a little older, it didn't really bother me as much. I think I found out pretty young and what rape was and what happened. And then by the time I got in high school, I had my best friend who's, you know, she's my best friend now. She had been abandoned by her mother. So we kind of, we would we would make jokes about it. You know, if we saw somebody, a bum on the street, she would be like, you know, there's your dad. Or if I saw a, a female, you know, who was a bum, I would be like, hey, there's your mom. You know, we just kind of, we formed a bond by both of us not really having that relationship or kind of knowing who those people were in our lives. So as a young child, I do remember being, you know, sad. I remember that incident, but I really, it wasn't something that I really dwelled on every day. Um, not that I can remember. So one of the things I think people find disconcerting, and I, I don't say that in a negative way, I'm just saying people trying to like figure out how Shamika feels, because you say, you said previously, and I think you've even said it today, that you had a good childhood. And, and one of the things I've tried to explain to people uh, that e even when you grow up poor as a kid, you don't really know that you're poor as a kid. I, I grew up very poor as a kid, no clue. 
No, and I even, all the way up to age 18, when me and my father were living in a 400 square foot, one bedroom apartment in the hood, I'm 17, 18 years old. I don't have any real clue that I'm poor, and I'm poor. My father, I think, at that time was making like $200 a week, uh, tending bar for one of his friends that owned a bar. Uh, he had a little raggedy car. I had a little raggedy Mustang that I drove to my house, but I was the most popular kid at my high school. I was the captain of my high school football team that was nationally ranked and won a state championship. I'm sleeping on the couch every night. I'm oblivious to the fact like, man, you poor. And so it's not, when I hear you say that despite these circumstances, your memory is, man, I had a great childhood. It's not disconcerting to me. I get it completely. But, but so I, I would for you, though, to explain a little bit deeper into how poor were you guys? What city were you living in? Were you were there other relatives living in this house? Other kids? Give us a little bit more detail on, you know, what your childhood was like. Um, so. I, again, I don't really know how poor we were. I do know that I was born to a 15 year old, so I can assume that we didn't have a lot. You know, my grandmother was an LPN and she was the one, I guess, running the household. It was three uncles there, my mother. And when I was about eight or nine years old, my cousin came to live with us because her mother was murdered, who um, her father was my uncle. And so it was. It was us in the house. And when I say I had a good childhood, like, you know, I was treated well. I was always dressed. I was never hungry. I played outside with, the, you know, with the other kids. I got to do extra activities. Like when I was six years old, my mother put me in baton. So I took baton lessons every Monday night. I was in gymnastics. I got to do jazz. I was in a, a drama department at the local community center. So I, I feel like I had a good childhood. I got to participate. I never had was given an excuse to not excel or to not be the best that I could be. So I never really took that mindset of we're poor. I joke now, you know, I told a story last year when I had to speak in D.C. about my grandmother serving dinner and she served green beans and macaroni and cheese. As an adult, I realized maybe at that time there wasn't enough money for me. But I remember saying to my grandma, like, Grandma, where's the meat? And I remember her saying back to me, the cheese is the meat. And as a little girl, I thought, oh, OK, cheese is meat. And so let me eat these green beans and macaroni and cheese. As an adult, though, I, I realized maybe at the time she didn't have enough money for, for me. I don't know. But I never felt like we were um, without. We always had. And I don't know, you know, what my mother or grandmother had to do to always have, but we always had. I had a bike. You know, when Atari came out, I had the 5200. I had a really good childhood, you know, from from my eyesight. You know, I just don't know what they had to do to make sure it was good, but it was good. I wasn't abused. I wasn't mistreated. I was always supported, always cheered on by anything that I did. You know, I, I had a really good childhood. Um, but of course, when you look at being born to a 15 year old, you, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth for sure. But I never really, even if my soul was flapping off the bottom of my shoe, I never considered myself poor or never had an excuse to not be good or great or excel. And so I'm listening to you tell a story. You're born to a 15 year old. You're a product of rape. Your best friend was abandoned by her mother. You had a relative that moved into the home whose mother was murdered, I think. You, and so that's a lot of trauma. And, and, and I'm wondering, at any time, have you had counseling or do you look back and understand like, Whew! I mean, there's one thing to, deal with poverty 
and, and you can be completely oblivious to that, and because I know that is the case with all kids, but that, that does seem like a, a high level of trauma within that, within that home. And I want, have you talked with anybody about that or have you reflected on any of that? So I have had counseling as an adult, especially when I was married and just having to go through not just couples counseling, but then individual counseling as well. I think I do look back and say, wow, like, you know, I, I am still here in, in spite of everything that I've been through. But at the time, it honestly didn't feel like a lot. But when I look back at some of the things that I've done and some of the things that I have endured or overcome, then it, it does seem like, wow, that, that was a lot. So going up in high school, right before or before you go off to college at North Carolina A&T, who were your friends? What were your activities? What, what, you know, one of the things I thought listening to you on Monday, I was like, man, Shamika had some shady friends. <laughs> uh, is, is that accurate? No, my close friends, they weren't shady, but I had some people that I did deal with that were a little shady. I was dating a guy my senior year of school who was arrested for attempted murder. I do believe that it came back as self-defense, but he wasn't allowed to go with me to the prom because we had to get our prom dates approved if they didn't go to the school and he had already uh, graduated and he didn't pass that because he had this issue going on as far as being, you know, arrested for attempted murder. Um, but my close friends, they were really good. You know, we, we graduated m most of all of us. There were like seven of us that hung really tight together in the top of our class, went off, went on to college. I graduated who's who among American high school students. I graduated a North Carolina scholar. Uh, so it, by all, you know, by a lot of people's definitions, we were really good kids, really good girls. So we didn't have any issues. Nobody would say, oh, they were gangsters or they were shady. You know, we we got in fights, some of us like a lot of people, but we weren't like uh, we weren't menaces to society. No, no one would say that. But I did have that one guy that I was dating my senior year who to me wasn't even raised that way either. But when you just kind of I guess listen to certain music or just feeling like this is the cool thing to do. You do it even though that's not really who you are. And so I feel like even just hanging around that, you know, I saw the good in him, but I can see how other people did not. So for me and my background it is I did. I don't feel like I knew and I'm a little bit older than you. Uh, by nearly a decade. I, I didn't know any girls that carried guns at 18, and, and particularly not on college campuses. And maybe there were some pistol packing girls and I was just oblivious to it uh, at Ball State. <laughs> and, 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 but that, that, I'm just, for other people, how does Shamika, honor roll student, uh, who's who, because the one thing that I think I'm also picking up is, sounds like your grandmother was very smart. To be an LPN at her age, back in those times in the South, she sounds like she probably had to be exceptional. And it sounds like your mother was headed down that track, sent off to, private school it sounds like to really try to excel and so I see where the intelligence is coming from you you were you inherited that or that that's part of your lineage uh, but I, I don't <laughs> tell me the city y'all were growing up in or the town and it just it sounds like it was a pretty rough and tumble place if if 
how are you packing a pistol at age 18? Okay, so I was raised in Durham, North Carolina. And when I went away to school, my friend was dating a guy who I said was from Fayetteville, North Carolina, but he was a football player. And I don't know how he got the gun, but he gave it to us and she was scared to carry it. I wasn't scared. So I started to carry his gun, but it, it was a nine millimeter. And to me, that was big. And so I liked carrying a gun, but it just didn't fit in my purse. Well, I don't even know why I liked carrying. Why did carrying you like a carrying a gun? Why did you know. like I carrying a gun? Because Dr. Dre said, who's the man with a master plan? A nigga with a gun. I don't, you know, I don't know. That was during the days of the chronic and listening to ghetto boys. Like I, you know, you had, um, the song out, you know, I want a gangster bitch. So just doing what seemed popular or just seemed like the fun thing to do at the time. I think that's kind of why I'm like, Oh, okay. You want a gangster bitch? That's me. Um, and so we would carry his gun. Let, let me stop just, you for a moment. Oh. Let, let me stop you for a moment because I want you to address this point that I think I'm hearing from you quite clearly. And it's something I've always believed. We keep running around with this myth that this gangster rap music doesn't influence young people. And you seem to be clearly stating, oh yes it does, which I totally agree with and believe and it's why your transparency and your honesty hit home with me so much and why I think it's important is because we keep living in this fantasy world of lies and all oh, this music is just like the movie The Godfather and it's blah 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 and I'm like no nah, man it's not just like that this music has significant influence and particularly on kids who don't have the stereotypical two-parent family structure where you have two parents instilling their wisdom, logic, and values in a kid. And, and a, you again, you're about eight, nine, ten years younger than me, but, but when kids your age grew up with headphones and uh, things like where you could plug into Dr. Dre's world completely and whoever the NWA and whatever and it does have a real influence and so I, I just I don't want to put words in your mouth but your thoughts yeah I do think what you listen to has has an influence on you and I'm actually grateful that I grew up during the time that I did because just as I had Dr. Dre in those years thankfully in the 80s I had a di you know different music. So I feel sorry for the kids who who have nothing else and all they have is some of what's out now on the radio and they're never um they they never get to experience anything else or hear anything else because I do believe that faith cometh by hearing. So if you constantly hear a certain thing, you do begin to believe that. It's just like if if a woman tells her son constantly, "You ain't gonna be nothing just like your your daddy." he's going to start to believe that. So I do believe when you're constantly hearing something and you're inundated with a certain thing all the time, it does have an effect on you. So we've already heard the story and we replayed it about what happened to you at, at North Carolina A&T. We talked about it on Monday a bit more in depth and you know, today we played a highlight from it, but uh, I, I'm just going to go over it because I, I really don't want to spend a lot of time dwelling and repeating that. I want to know how you transitioned and where you're at now, but I'm just going to re restate for people that didn't see what was said earlier. Shamika got into a fight with another young woman at North Carolina, North Carolina A&T. Uh, they all ran off and then y'all saw each other later in the day or later in the afternoon or evening? Or so what happened was I got into the fight. At the time, I was wearing a, a leg brace because I had um, sprained a ligament in my knee. And so at, when we were fighting, I did step away from her and I pulled my gun out 
pretty much as to say, if you're not going to make the decision on your own to get away from me, let me help you. And so nothing happened. She she ran off. We got in our cars. We left and I left campus and I went over to the guy's house and I was sitting there. We were sitting there watching TV. It was me and the other female was another as one of my friends and they came knocking on the door. And so it was about, I don't know, seven or eight girls, somewhere between six and eight girls. And they then wanted to threaten me and they wanted to t let me know. And I was saying how she was holding her hands inside her coat at the time. And she was telling me that when she pulled out her gun, she was going to use it because you shouldn't pull out a gun if you're not going to use it. So at this point, I'm thinking, gosh, I'm going to have to shoot her before she shoots me. And it, w it was a situation where they to me then came looking for trouble and then wanted to threaten my life because the first incident was over. We had already left campus. You know, I didn't try to threaten her with the gun at the time, or I didn't say, Hey, when I see you again, I'm going to get you none of that. Um, but then she went and got some of her family that lived in the city. And I guess her family may have gotten other people. I don't know, but, uh, seven or eight girls showed up where I was knocking on the door and she was saying, you know, when I pull out my gun, I'm going to use it. So I really thought she had a gun and I felt like when she went to pull her hands out, I was going to shoot her, you know, that, you know, people listen to it and feel like, uh, I should have made a different decision. I think my decision would have been made prior to that time in who I was dealing with to start with. Um, but as far as at that moment, I, you know, I don't know if they expected me to break out into a uh, kumbaya. I don't know, but I thought my life was in danger. And for me, um, I was going to shoot her before she shot me because she said, when I pull out my gun, I'm going to use it. So I thought she had a gun and uh, I, I don't think she she did um, unless she just didn't have it in her hands when she pulled them out of her coat. But I shot at her and when she the other girls ran, but when she dropped down, then I held the gun to her head and it just everything happened so fast. And um I pulled the trigger again and the gun jammed. And when she realized that, I think when we both realized I didn't shoot her, she got up and ran and I went inside and, and closed the door. And as we talked about earlier, this never landed in the hands of the police. Everybody seem to leave it as a street thing and everyone goes their separate ways and y'all don't run into each other anymore? We do. She ended up coming to a party that I had, uh, I don't know, some months later, but there, there, nothing happened at that party. I can't remember. I mean, she knew it was me. She ended up leaving the party, but nothing happened even then at that time. I can't remember if people were like, making jokes about it but i do remember her coming to a party after then we we may have even like squashed it then i can't really remember we're talking almost 30 years ago but i do remember her coming to a party but nothing big happened after that and so for a lot of people and i would include myself in that a lot of people it, it's 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 hard to think about someone shot at me. I see them months later and it's really not that big of a deal. And people just move on from that. That's, and so the number one thing, and I've, I've visited Durham uh, many times, Duke and North Carolina University are there. I've covered basketball games at both places. I stayed in Durham for uh, three or four weeks at a time before I just, <laughs> I didn't know that this Durham actually existed 
uh, but you know, I guess that actually exists everywhere across the country. Uh, before we get to the second half of the story, Shamik, I want to take a break because I want to tell the viewers about uh, my good friends over at Good Ranchers. Uh, with the holidays coming quickly around the corner, you need to see our friends over at Good Ranchers. They'll be able to provide everyone in your family with an amazing holiday feast that will be talked about for years. Their newly added selection of honey hickory ham is perfect for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And if you pair that with their great family feast bundle, you'll have everything covered for a great holiday family dinner. I can all, it can all be shipped safely to you in the comfort of your home at a price and quality their competitors just can't beat. So stop waiting and go order right now before it is too late. If you subscribe, you'll get $20 off and free express shipping. Get steakhouse quality for less than $5 a meal. Go to goodranchers.com slash fearless. Go support Good Ranchers. You'll get $20 off and free express shipping if you go to goodranchers.com slash fearless. Good Ranchers supports me. They support this show. They support you. You need to support them. They're an American first company. They're supporters of ours. Hop on board with Good Ranchers. Be a good fearless soldier and hop on board with goodranchers.com. All right slash fearless. All right, let's go back to Shamika. And uh, Shamika, so I hear this story. This happened at 18. Certainly the person you are today, as opposed to who you were then, there's been a transformation. And how did that transformation come about? So I think, as I told you before, I think it was just a series of things. Um, so I don't have exactly one particular thing. I do remember my mother telling me that I would die a horrible death because I was mean as a snake. So I remember not wanting to die a horrible death and to work on myself and not be mean as a snake. Um, and I think just some things happened where I was still hanging around, you know, people, not bad people, but people doing things that were, were not good. And I was telling you the other day about being robbed at gunpoint. I was there braiding my best friend's hair. She was uh, selling weed at the time and we were robbed uh, because they wanted to come and get the drugs and the money. And I think that was a learning lesson for me that you don't sit around in a place where something like that could happen. And um, so that was, that was, that happened. Uh, someone came looking for my uncles at one point, they shot up the house, shot up the car. I was inside. I had just hung up the phone because in those days, you know, if you, even if you had a cordless phone, you would put it on the base. And one of the bullets came through the house, uh, through the door, through the wall and hit the freezer where I had just been standing. And I'm like, okay, I, like I knew I can't be around people that don't want to live or stay alive. And so just a series of things happening and realizing, okay, like I knew I couldn't carry a gun, but I hadn't got to the point where I realized I shouldn't be around people who were still doing, you know, things that I wasn't doing. So then I graduated to that point of realizing I don't want to be around somebody that's living a different life than I am. And, um, so I think just growing, just evolving and, and learning, I, there wasn't one particular thing that changed me. Like I didn't have just this epiphany, like, oh, I'm, I got to be different. It was really just kind of evolving and growing. And then in 2001, the New Year's Eve going into 2001, we always went to church on New Year's Eve. That's how I was raised. Even if I went to a party afterwards, I went to church first. There was a preacher there and he had a very young congregation and he just was very relatable. And he, he came to visit our church and he was just very relatable. And I heard him and 
I wanted to to find more about how he had these young people in his church that really seemed like they were into living uh, Christian lives. So I started going to his church and that also started a, a change in me, just being more excited about the Bible and learning about God and having a closer relationship. So that pretty much changed for me. And I do believe it was, it may have been this, the actual, the year going into 2000. I can't really remember, but it was somewhere around that time. And I started attending his church and just learning more about the Bible and just continued my evolution from there. The, the evolution I felt I was already on because my daughter was born in 96 before then. And so there were a lot of things that I wanted to do differently once I had a child as well. And so I, I don't ask any of these questions uh, disrespectfully, but I just w want to understand. Uh, I know at one point in conversations this week, and, I, I wasn't clear on this, but I should have been, should have guessed or known based on the cover of your book. But at one point in your 18, 19 years old, you're working as a dancer, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in an adult club. And, and so you go from a stripping to, were you, and, I, and again, I'm not asking disrespectfully, I'm just trying to understand. Did at some point you became an ordained minister and that was not a joke? You, 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 and so walk me, how do you go from stripping to ordained minister? Walk me through that. So I was stripping at 18. And um, so I go from that to having a child at 21 really wanting to do things differently for her. And then by the time I joined this new church that I was just talking about, I just got really into learning about God. Although I had been raised in the church, there, there was a lot that I knew. I didn't have that love or that desire for actually walking the talk. You know what I mean? And so at this point, that's kind of when that fire was sparked in me to actually do what the Bible was telling us to do. And so uh, at 18, I stopped stripping because the guy that I was dating, I think maybe he had some type of like he knew because it was a secret. It wasn't something popular back then. Like now girls brag about it and people know that they're strippers and they think it's the cool thing to do. Then it was something that I hid and I was quiet about. It wasn't something that you celebrated and, you know, told everybody about. And so I think the guy may have gotten wind that maybe I was doing that. He wasn't sure. And I remember him telling me, if I ever found out you were doing something like that, I would never talk to you again. And I quit. So, um, that's how I got out of stripping because I, I, he told me he would never talk to me again. And that was important to me. And so I stopped then. Uh, but fast forward to, to preaching, I was licensed in 2002 and ordained some years after that. Licensed to preach is what I mean. And then why did you walk away from the ministry? There were a lot of things uh, that I didn't like and just a lot of things that did not sit well with me as far as church is concerned. Like, I still feel like I have a message. I still feel like I have a reason for being here or a purpose. But there were a lot of things in church or the churches that I attended at the time that I didn't like. One of those things uh, was the order. I, I didn't really see what I thought. And it's, it's so weird because when I say that I believe men should be in charge, it's not like I grew up seeing that in my household. So I truly believe that that is something uh, within us 
that really resonates. And if you don't believe that, it's because you've been conditioned against your very nature. So when I say these things, I really believe that's the way it's supposed to be. But in church, I didn't see that. I saw a lot of women in charge. I saw a lot of men being emasculated and it was okay. You know, I felt like um, we weren't really being taught what we should have been taught. And for me, it had a, a, a great effect on my marriage. You know, it was one of the things that had a, a big, big effect on my marriage. And I just saw too much pomp and circumstance in the church, too much of wanting to, to be important or, you know, wanting to have a title and be reverenced a certain way even if you weren't living the way that you should it was it was too much of that and so i just wasn't in a in a in agreement with that and i felt like there must be more than this for real like just coming to church on sundays and wednesdays for bible study and running around the church and shouting and falling out it has to be more than this and so I didn't really feel like it was having the effect that I thought it should have on first my life and then the reach that I thought, you know, for other people. I saw a lot of people lying. That's how I was when I talk about how naked girls came to be. I feel like if I had had some people around me that were honest maybe there would have been a different outcome. I don't know. But I felt like people were wearing masks. People lie. People, you know, are in disguise. They weren't real. They weren't open. I had an issue with that, and I did not want to be that person. So I felt like I wanted to be the person that I wish I had when when I needed help or when I needed somebody to be honest with me or when I needed somebody to say, hey, girl, uh, you're about to make a big mistake, I know, because I did this. Or, you know, people just, I feel like in the church, they feel like they have to uh, lie about who they really are or the things that they struggle with. They'll tell you a little bit because it sounds good in a sermon, but everything is always just sugar-coated, in my opinion, in the church. And I didn't like that. And I didn't feel like that was what I was supposed to be doing. I felt like my purpose was to be transparent and to be honest and to be that person that I don't feel like I had. And so when did you transition into talking about, speaking about uh, politics? I, I, I find you told me at some point you attended CPAC and w when did this version of Shamika come about? So um, after going through divorce, I divorced in 2012. I started Naked Girls in 2013. So I've been online kind of just speaking about things that I've learned over the years. And I never profess to be right, but I always profess to be honest. And I think that drew people to me. So I've been online for, for years now, just really talking about things that I see going on in the culture or the community. And I happened to get kicked off Facebook for saying that Father's Day was for men. And so I started putting my videos on Twitter because my best friend said, oh, you only want to be on Facebook so you can be nosy and see what's going on in Durham. Start putting your stuff out on Twitter. So that's what I did. And what I noticed was uh, it was conservatives that kind of flocked to my message. And I didn't understand why, because I thought I was just talking common sense stuff, you know, about men being the leaders and uh, running their household and women can't be men, men can't be women. You know, I'm thinking I'm just talking about common sense stuff. I didn't even really know that it fell along party lines or anything like that. And so in 2018, I think that's when the Kavanaugh hearings were going on. And so I just started putting out my thoughts about that. And people started to flock to me and kind of say, hey, would you, you know, come on to talk about this? Or can we get you to participate in this event? And so I realized how much politics kind of uh, in intertwined with life 
something that I didn't really think about before. Um, my children all went to charter schools. So here it is. I believed in school choice, but at the time I never knew that even that kind of fell along party lines and that there were people who didn't believe in school choice and thought that was bad. And, you know, so I kind of just got in it just really by, by being honest and sharing me and sharing my truth. And that's how I got into to, to politics that way, just looking at stuff and saying, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that you want me to call a female a boy or that you want to tell boys they can have periods. Like, that didn't make sense to me. And so I always feel like, you know, it was just me talking about common sense things. And I didn't, I did it so open and honestly that I guess people just like to hear that. And so that's just me being me. We'll end here by what is it that you want to accomplish? What, 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 what do you want to do with the next five years, 20 years of Shamika Michelle? I want to, uh, I want people to start being who they really are. And I was talking to you earlier and I know that people felt like, oh, well, is she sorry about what she used to do or, you know, has she really changed? And I get irritated sometimes with people in church because I often wonder, do they believe what they claim that they believe? So if, if I could do anything, it would be to have people be more open, be more honest, be who you really are and believe what it is that you say you believe, whatever it is. If you say you're a Christian, well, how can you ask me, am, am I remorseful for things that I did 30 years ago if I've already repented? If I believe that I'm a new creature, if I believe old things passed away, if I believe, behold, all things become new, then I expect Christians to see that and really believe that. If I believe life and death is in the power of the tongue, I expect people to, or if you claim that's what you believe, not saying you, Jason, but people, I expect to see that in people, to stop just um, saying if it ain't one thing, it's another. If it ain't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. Like, I just want people to start being open and honest and really just trying to be good people and realize that you're going to make mistakes. You know, no one is perfect, but you can actually make mistakes, repent and move on and, and be a better person and not live under the guilt and shame for a mistake that you've made, but you can continue to evolve. One of the things I was told a long time ago is that anything that doesn't grow is either dead or retarded. So if you aren't dead or retarded, you should forever be growing, forever be evolving. And that's what I want people to realize. You don't have to be stuck and you don't have to stay where you once were. You can actually evolve and you should. If you're still alive, you should be a, a new person each day. You should always be growing, always be evolving. And that's what I, I think I want people to do is just be open, be honest and evolve and continue to grow until you take your last breath on this earth in this plane. Shamika, that's all I have for you. I think th this was great. I'm glad you were uh, this transparent and honest about uh, yourself and your past. I'm going to let you go and I'm going to say a few uh, parting words and wrap this up. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, we'll hear from you thank on you. Monday or Tuesday next week. Love having you as a part of this show. Appreciate you sharing uh, today. Uh, so before we get out of here, I know some of you listening to that story, probably the same, hearing it the same way I did, and like, terminal, like, whoa, a lot of trauma, a lot of life experiences that are like, wow, I, I don't know if I could have survived all those different twists and turns and all that trauma and, and um, 
And you're probably sitting there wondering because some of the way she unpacks the story is so matter of fact. And, and it's like she, she grew up and lives in a different reality and culture than perhaps you're familiar with. And because some of it, it, it strikes me that way as well. But even though I didn't completely grow up like Shamika, I certainly know people who do and did. And I love the way she wrapped up uh, her story with, uh, you know, basically calling us out as Christians to live up to the things we say we believe in and allow people to evolve and, and, and move on and still be respectful of them and their life experience and, and know that they have something to offer the world beyond the trauma that they may have experienced or been involved in. Uh, I think Shamika has something important to say and I, I think I want myself and this show to help her, to help hone her message and to help her help people understand people that come out of different situations than the perhaps the normal or what we perceive as the normal culture and environment. Um, I'm just glad uh, we stumbled upon Shamika, brought her onto the show. I think she's gonna remain an asset on the show. Uh, but I, I, wanted, I wanted myself and I wanted the audience to know who Shamika is and wanted you to know her background so that you could uh, better understand her point of view and perspective. All right, so uh, let's roll some Tamara and uh, we'll roll out of here and uh, we'll see you on Monday. Uh, thanks for uh, joining me. That's it and that's all.